we have somebody with us. Well, it's not easy to win a Pulitzer Prize and a Tony Award, but more to the point, you've never been to a wedding since 1965 <laughs> where you haven't heard, is this the little boy I carry? Is this the little girl in play? Mr. Sheldon Harding. The two best performances that Zero gave were opening night, where he had to behave, and then for the Actors Fund, when all the actors were out there. And he was, well, he was never less than brilliant. What bothered me was that my friends who were using my house seats, so they would see the show on their own, they would, they would call and say, Sheldon, the show is wonderful. But did you know that Zero was doing this, or doing that, or that? And there was nothing to be done about it. Audiences adored him, no matter what he did. And he was brilliant. Uh, tip, this is typical. When we were in Detroit on our, our pre-Broadway tour, Jerry Robbins gave Zero a piece of business in it for a rich man. He had a milk can next to him. So at one point in the song, he sighs and he lowers his arm and it goes into the milk can. And he takes it out and all Robbins wanted him to do was to look at his sleeve and then look at God as though to say, this too you do to me. <laughs> But within two days or three days, this, the song was now about what you do with a wet sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> you take it and you, it becomes perfume behind the ear. <laughs> or you grease the wheels of your wagon with it. Or if nothing else, you ring it out over the orchestra pit. <laughs> and the audience laughs and the bassoon player wants to kill him because <laughs> it's going into his bassoon, his $1,500 instrument. So about the third day, I was watching, Zero sighed, he lowered his arm, and he brought it out. There was no milk. <laughs> that was Robin's way. He just struck the milk. So, but that's what he would do. At one point, um, Hal Prince, we had a meeting with him. He said, uh, a reviewer from one of the Kentucky papers, I can't remember which one it was, had seen the show and gone back to his home paper in Kentucky and written a review saying, this is a wonderful show, but wait until Zero Mostel has left because he is distorting too many scenes. And Hal had written a letter, which uh, Jerry Bach and Joe Stein and all, we all had to vet it to see whether it was appropriate. And it was a, it was a letter to Zero, which said, dear Zero, we realize what a genius you are, and how brilliant you are, and how tiring it must be, and how boring it must be to do exactly the same show every night. So we expect you to invent. We expect you to change things. All we're asking is that on occasion, if by chance we think you've gone too far, could we speak to you? <laughs> Zero hit the ceiling. He said, nobody tells me what to do. This show is a success because of me. And he believed that. He really believed that. He had to leave the show be, uh, and it was amazing to watch him dance on the stage, and then as soon as he got into the wings, his dresser would hand him a cane, and he would limp back to his dressing room. So Zero had been in the show about eight months, eight and a half months, something like that, and he and the doctor prepared a letter, and Hal Prince uh, showed it to us. It said, Mr. Mustel cannot do this show the way he does it eight times a week. It's just physically too demanding for him. So what we are requesting is that he will be in the show three months and be out of the show three months. And Hal Prince said, I'd love to oblige, but we can't. Nobody's going to buy tickets for those three months. They'll wait till he comes back. And so he left the show. Uh, every, so many people tell me that they saw Zero in it. I, I know that they didn't all see it because he, <laughs> he was only in the show about nine months. And we gave him a party on stage. He went to his dressing room, he shaved off his beard, he came back, and with all of, the, all of the difficulties he'd given us, it was a very sentimental evening because at his best, he was extraordinary. And I went to him and I said, Zero, I'm really sorry to leave you to see the show. And he said, no, you're not. You're sorry to see the grosses fall. <laughs> and it broke Zero's heart that the grosses never fell. <laughs> Deep. Deep in Fiddler, there's a line, Rabbi, wouldn't this be a wonderful time for the Messiah to come? And at that point, there was a wonderful song called When Messiah Comes. Yeah. Uh, you know it, huh? When Messiah Comes, he will say it to us, I apologize that it took so long, but I had such trouble finding you. 
over here a few, over there a few. As a 19-year-old boy, I wrote Harold Prince and said, why did you drop that song? He said he was playing it too lugubriously. No, 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 that's not. Are you sure he said that? I'll show you the letter. Because that's not true. It, we were in Detroit on the pre-Broadway tryout, and uh, this, this song had been one of the most successful songs at the Becker's audition. That was because it was kind of quasi out of context. In context, it didn't work. And people would be passing through from New York and would say, why isn't the song working? And they would look at us and say, are you crazy? Are you crazy? This is a scene where the whole community is being evicted. They're being asked to leave. It's a tragic moment. And you're doing a comedy song? You expect people to laugh? They can't. So we cut the, show, we cut the song, and Zero was very upset because he loved the song. It was one of his favorite songs. But it just didn't work because in context, it made no sense to try and, and make jokes. During rehearsals, I, would, I was listening to him rehearse If I Were a Rich Man. And I thought, hmm, most of the song is just very droll. It's very amusing, and he's wonderful doing it. And then suddenly it gets serious at the end. I think maybe I should rewrite the ending so that the whole thing is droll. And I mentioned this to Hal and Zero and uh, Jerry Robbins. And Zero turned on me. He said, Sheldon, you don't know the man. You cannot take that ending away. That's the man. The rest of it is, is charming and it's funny. But the, the man who wants to sit by the, the Eastern Wall, the religious man, the man who wants to sit with the wise man, that's the man. Don't you dare change that. And he was right. And I, I owe him that. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful.